Hi there, um, and welcome to our 23rd Octoprint on Air. Uh, I'm your host, Gina Heuske, as usual. And I hope uh, me always saying my name like this will also sometimes maybe help clarify the question how to pronounce it for good. Um, yeah, uh, so as usual, we'll just simply start with a short outline of what I'll be talking to you uh, about today. I think that was correct English. If not, please excuse me. It's Friday. <laughs> um, so first of all, I will, uh, as always, be telling you what I've been up to the past week since the last uh, Octoprint on Air episode, then what the next immediate steps will be. Then we'll have a quick look uh, at the usage statistics of Octoprint, uh, which are provided by the new anonymous usage uh, tracking uh, plugin that's part of 1.3.10 and up. And then we'll have a short Q&A segment. In this case, it will probably be really, really short because there was only one question left in the backlog. Um, so uh, be sure to just make use of the live chat, which on desktop you, bef you will find uh, on the over there. <laughs> this left, right stuff always confuses me tremendously when I, when I see myself mirrored in front of me. And uh, on mobile, it will be below. Uh, so use that, please, to, to ask additional questions if you're watching this live, uh, should you have any, so that uh, yeah, the Q&A segment consists of more than one Q&A, maybe. Yeah. In any case, I'll keep an eye on the live chat, uh, so, uh, so uh, feel free to use it. Okay, and with that, we can already jump into what I've been up to. So it's been a while since the last uh, broadcast. I actually realized with a bit of horror recently that it uh, that the last one was back in February. I thought we had had one in March and I I don't know what happened there, but really these past two months, they went by in less than what usually I would perceive a one month in. So sorry for that. So uh, I'm now going to cover basically what happened over the duration of two months instead of just one as usual. Um, so those of you who watched the last episode might remember that back then I said, yeah, the coming Monday, we are going to have a forum move and please uh, keep your fingers crossed for that, that everything works out fine and we won't run into any issues with this. And apparently you did because we didn't run into any pro really problematic issues with this. And uh, yeah, so the move uh, happened pretty much uh, without any hiccups. Um, we also have a small write-up on the Octoblog about it. If you want to get a bit more behind the scenes info of the issues that we did run in and uh, what changed and why it changed and all that. And uh, yeah, I also want to take the opportunity to say a huge thank you to uh, Jubalith, who not only did the move, but has been a kick-ass admin ever since he uh, yeah became the admin. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is really helping me a ton and uh, the forums are rock solid and so far everything is just working smoothly and I couldn't be happier. So thanks. Um, so what else did I do? Uh, yeah, so back in February I was still and, and early early March I was also still uh, heavily working on uh, 140. As you remember, um, one of the things that were still very fresh during the last broadcast was uh, merging a couple of um, pull requests that provide uh, compatibility of Octoprint to Python 3. Uh, and as a quick refresher, while we need this, uh, Python 2 is going to be end of life uh, come January 2020. So we really need to get Octoprint compatible to Python 3 now. Um, and 140 is now compatible. There were just still just some uh, some hiccups here and there. And I spent a lot of time, uh, yeah, looking further into them. There was also still this question of what to do about plugins that are out there, third-party plugins, how to yeah, figure out if they are Python 3 compatible or not, and um, how to basically be able to detect those that are not and not load them on, a, on an Octoprint instance running on under Python 3. So one of the things that I also did was, yeah, basically add a compatibility flag to uh, the plugin system. So if you now are a plugin author and you have verified that um, your plugin is Python 3 compatible, then you can set this flag and then Octoprint will still load your plugin even when it is running under Python 3, otherwise it won't. And I also added uh, yeah, a similar mechanism to the plugin repository so that all plugins in there are currently flagged as only Python 2 compatible. And per per when we figure it out and when authors, uh, plugin authors give me the, the um, yeah, the corresponding ping, basically, we can then 
um, flag these plugins as compatible as well and then hopefully yeah, over time we will get a uh, get a good migration of all plugins out there over to Python three compatibility. Compatibility, tricky word. <laughs> yeah. So and then there were a ton of bug fixes, of merge errors, and all that that happened. Also, when merging my, uh, stuff from maintenance up into Devil, and yeah, that took a lot of time. Uh, but I, what I also spent quite a significant amount of time on was uh, more work on the new com layer. As they usually say, 20% of of uh, the final 20% of the feature set usually take 80% of their time, and I fear it's true in this case as well. So the the yeah the the work that I'm currently doing on the new com layer is basically trying to get it to feature parity with uh, the existing one. So we are right now at the point where it prints and it can also stream to SD and it can do a lot of what it has to do in order to use it to print. But there are still some things, some some hooks that aren't working, and some um, yeah, some of the more uh, let's say uh, less usually uh, less commonly used features uh, like like feedback uh, controls and all that. That stuff still needs to be worked in. And uh, yeah, there there's still quite a number of these things that I have to put in there before I can say okay, now it's nearing the point where we can merge it but at least it's printing which is that was like the biggest hurdle and i also have to still take a look at some of the more obscure recent scenarios uh, that make sure that those are also working and fine and all that but yeah as i said it's it's making good progress at least something which is good yeah and then uh, yeah basically starting early march i um uh, I realized that it was really, 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 really time to get 1.3.11 out of the door and started uh, yeah, working on the final steps toward that. There were still some uh, bugs in the backlog and some feature requests that I really wanted to get into 1.3.11, so I first took care of that and then I prepared a first release candidate, which was released on March 28th. And since then, we've now also had uh, the second one on April 4th and the third just yesterday on April 11th. And yeah, the, the funny thing about these release candidates compared to past release candidates really is that there's so little f f feedback uh, in the in the feedback tickets this time around, um, which usually would make me very, very, very nervous because I would think, oh, nobody's testing it and I don't know if there are bugs or not and such. And the good thing is this time I have usage tracking. <laughs> so what I am now able to see is that apparently yeah, you, you are just using it and it's working fine and uh, it's printing like, I don't know, what, what were the numbers again? Let me quickly check. Yeah, they're like eight hours on RC1, eight, 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 eight thousand, sorry, 8,000 printed hours on RC1 and, and 7,000 on RC2 and already 350 on RC3. So apparently that stuff is working and I didn't break it completely. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, the, then uh, the few bucks that still were in there, um, yeah, I got some tickets for them, but there's also something else which is making uh, this whole RC phase uh, very different from any past ones that I did because 1.3.11 comes with a new error tracking plugin now also bundled and uh, this error tracking uh, now also allowed me to see some of the issues that apparently people were running into with the RC but not reporting back to me and could tackle those as well and this is really really great so bugs are now coming to me without anyone having to lift a finger for that basically if they have the error tracking plugin enabled. It is disabled by default, but if you're running the release candidate uh, channel in Octoprint, it will basically show you a little notification bubble telling you, hi, you could really, really help me if you enabled this. And if you then enable it, then I get data. Yeah, and um, all this is uh, thanks to getting an uh, Sentry IO account sponsored by the Sentry IO team. So very, very, uh, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, and uh, 1311 uh, RC1 was still set to also report plug-in errors, uh, also, uh, so 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 errors from exceptions and all that from from third-party plugins. And what I learned, what I very very quickly learned, is that I had to significantly dial down these errors, uh, this this error reporting, um, because yeah, apparently there are a lot of third-party plugins out there that have a lot of small 
but present errors that were basically eating up all my sponsored plan limits. So yeah, that was a kind of disturbing experience. So um, if any uh, plugin authors are watching this right now, I really want to urge you, please look into your logs. Take a look if there are any exceptions being logged, because from the looks of it, a ton of third party plugins are constantly logging exceptions. And um, yeah, that really shouldn't be the case. So some some things like misnamed variables being called and then triggering a no such thing error, basically things like this. So 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 stuff that should hopefully be really easy to find and fix. And uh, yeah, I, I had to disable the disable uh, error reporting for plugins completely now for third party plugins. So my, my bundle wants to uh, do error reporting, but the, the, the third party ones don't because it yeah it was simply too much noise. I wasn't able able to um, find all the find the actual problems with with core components anymore due to that. So consider this a plea, plea <laughs> from my end uh, in in the direction of of, of plugin authors. Yeah, and um, I will not give you any kind of access to this error tracking, contrary to the anonymous usage uh, um, tracking where long term I want to to give some some read only access to this can con the error tracking can still contain sensitive information like, I don't know, some files on the disk or stuff, things that I cannot use for anything, but I also do not want anyone else to see, you know, because I don't know, someone might not like that. So what, what I can do though is so that you just get an idea of what I'm seeing here is show you, um, show you one of, uh, of the errors that I triggered myself during uh, development so that you can see basically what kind of information I now have access to if the error tracking plugin is enabled and why this is very, very helpful for me in order to figure out problems. So I want to just quickly switch you over and I hope this worked. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is an error that I accidentally actually built into code yesterday, just before releasing RC3. And, um, so um, what we see here is basically, first of all, just an overview, what happened, what kind of uh, logging um, output was logged. And the really, really interesting bit is, first of all, of course, the log message, but also what I get here is the full stack trace of any exceptions that are logged, including the code lines and, and this is really, really helpful, including the supplied parameters to the current function. So. What this allowed me in the past with other errors, which will um, be fixed in 1.3.11 uh, and 1.3.12 uh, as well, is that I see why the, uh, yeah, uh, how a specific um, error condition was reached. For example, in case of any kind of geared encoding issues on the uh, serial console or something like that, I can see what I got back from the printer if it is supplied. Uh, to the function where the error happened, things like this. And this is really, really helpful. And I can also do this um, uh, for, yeah, for for all levels of the of the stack trace. And that way really get a really good picture of uh, the parameters with which uh, something was invoked and um, get a good idea on how to solve it, hopefully. And uh, this is already helped uh, with at least one no, at least I think even two bugs that were uh, raised during the um, yeah the RC phase so far, where uh, yeah well where meaningful and helpful locks were missing, um, because based on the description of the problem that arose, I could at least figure out what to look for in the in the error tracking uh, um, dashboard. And then I found stack traces and could figure out what happened. And this is really nice and will really speed up fixing bugs, I hope. Yeah, and um, it also gives me the option that if, if someone can reliably produce an error and there is not, not something helpful in the, in the logs and all that in the future, then I can also tell them, hey, please enable error tracking. Uh, you just have to click that button uh in, in in settings error tracking enable and then i and then reproduce the error and then i ho can hopefully see the issue especially if you tell me the id of your instance and yeah so this is hopefully going to be a really really helpful tool in the long term it certainly was already a very very helpful tool in the short term 
of uh, yeah during during RC one two and three so far and uh, yeah I'm I'm monitoring it now again and uh, waiting for any stuff that I find that looks like a regression in RC three and if so it will also help me to uh, yeah prepare RC four or uh, deem the whole uh, thing as uh, stable so yeah this is really nice to have and I should have done this ages ago. <laughs> But I never got around to it, and now I finally did, and I'm really, really glad that I did. Yeah. Okay, so this is, has basically been what I've been up to. Uh, doesn't sound like much, all in all. I mean, 140 and 1311, but trust me, it was a ton of work. And uh, yeah, this is also basically how we are, how I'll proceed. So the next steps will be, of course, uh, finalizing 1311. So either. Uh, either push out another release candidate or what I really hope be able to release the final stable release. Depends on the feedback that I get, depends on the errors that I see, depends on uh, um, yeah, depends on these uh, factors. Uh, one thing though is that uh, regardless of how the feedback looks, um, I will definitely only uh, release 1.3.11 stable or RC4 in um so after yeah early may, may uh, in the first may week the uh, the earliest because um and this is the other next steps um so first of all what i now will t uh, do is take a little break until eastern because um yeah uh, it's now been uh, four months of working straight through and i'm, I'm i really need uh, some some days off Especially because at the uh, so in in two weeks time at this at this time actually I will already be up in Helsingborg in Sweden in order to attend the 3D Meetup Sweden, um, which will take place from April 27th to 28th in Helsingborg, as I already said. Um, I got invited there to give um, a talk about the challenges of developing Octoprint, and I will give this talk on both days. So. Um, and I just got corrected that it is Easter and not Eastern. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I'm really looking forward to attending this event because I've heard a lot of pleasant, pleasant things about it. And uh, it looks like it's going to be a really awesome community event. And should you also be there, please, please, please say hi. Uh, I don't bite. Don't be shy. Um, and uh, I, I really, yeah, I really would love to shake some hands and uh, it really makes me happy when, when I get the chance to meet people who use my software because normally I just sit here and code away on it and the, the maximum I get in terms of interaction is textual. So if, uh, if you are there, if you see me, please be sure to say hi. So, okay. And when I'm back from that and have recovered from the lack of sleep which i get with which i guess will probably happen is um that i will uh yeah release 1311 or the rc4 or whatever so basically continue with that and once 1311 is finally done i can also finally return to the whole 140 stuff because yeah sadly as usual whenever i'm in this release candidate phase uh yeah that's all i can do basically because i constantly have to take a look at uh feedback that i get try to evaluate any kind of errors that i see i'm i'm also yeah just really not able to focus longer on any kind of other development because yeah there's there's stuff going on with the release candidate all the time so um yeah as usual this has put 140 on the back burner again ever since i put out the first rc so i hope that once i have the final release out i can return to that what what means i uh, it, i don't only hope that i count on it <laughs> because i will make it so yeah okay um so that would be the next steps and now i promised you a quick look at the stats um there is something very funny in there this time um which had me puzzled for a while and actually still has me puzzled because i'm not really sure what happened there okay so um these are again the uh, stats over the last three days and this is the funny thing that I mentioned because 
on uh, on March 29th, we still had 26.8 thousand uh, instances worldwide. Then the day after, suddenly, uh, yeah, 3,000 vanished, and then they returned, or and and brought some friends with them. So. I really don't know why why 3000 instances vanished for a period of 24 hours there but the only uh, idea that I currently have is some big ISP in some bigger part big bigger uh, more populated area or something like that breaking down. I haven't yet um tried to see if there's a geographical um uh, how do you say um Häufung yeah Great, my, my English is leaving me. So if, if all these instances are in one or in, in, in one tight area or something like that, um, because I haven't had the time to dig into the data for this, but I was just glad when, when all they, they all showed up again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, if you want to take any guesses, feel free. <laughs> and uh, another interesting thing, which made me think for a while or no uh, the tracking server has stopped working is this hour here with absolutely no data and that is not really that interesting because uh, it happens to be um, uh, three o'clock on the on the sunday on which the european summertime started so this is where they stole me an hour of my life again <laughs> yeah but i i just found it funny that it i mean of course it would show up in there but it was like when i saw this in the morning because i was still waiting for this situation to resolve itself and then suddenly everything was missing i was like oh no no it's broken completely and i was already sshing into the box and checking things and then i remembered wait this night it went from uh, it went directly from two to three a.m. without uh, anything in between. Yeah, so this is the reason for that. And what you can also see, of course, here is uh, yeah the number of instances um, uh, in the past twenty four hours of the various new release candidates that are out there, and also how much they have printed over here, and yeah. It's also a bit visible here, but compared to the whole stable version uh, numbers here, it, it's really hard to see the the, the small blips uh, down here of the release candidates, of the printed hours of the release candidates, but they are there. You, you can somehow see them. You also see that at first it's more like the yellow here, the RC1, and then it suddenly is more the blue stuff, the RC2, and then it turns into the red, which is the RC3. So, yeah. It's it's there in the diagrams. Yeah, another thing that I added in uh, in the one three eleven RCs and which is going to be very interesting in, in the future, I think, is uh, first of all here unsafe uh, firmware warnings, and I'm re really present uh, pleasantly surprised that there are way less uh, unsafe firmwares out there among those at least who test the RCs than I feared there would be. Uh, but there still are quite some of them there. So maybe if you test an RC, please do not ignore this error. Fix your printer. Thank you. Um, and another thing that I added is this here. Um, I occasionally run into the issue that um, some Firmware var 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 variant, 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 whatever. Um, that's some, um, yeah, that's some firmware fork out there. Uh, suddenly changes some kind of error message, and I have no idea about it. And then Octopen cannot parse it, and runs into issues. And people report that their printer just stopped printing, and uh, I have no idea why. And uh, then they also do not provide logs for that, and you know the usual drift if they even report it at all. So I figured, okay, um, if, if the firmware reports an error, uh, it's pretty trivial for me to also track that in the, in the usage tracking uh, plugin thingy. So this is what I did for 1.3.11. And um, there are errors in there that I've never before seen. So this is really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also find it funny how 
dominating the thermal runaway problems are. But too far from reference point, for example, I never encountered myself, so it's interesting to see that this exists. And also what you see here is, is a version of the thermal runaway where it doesn't contain this information, which is a bit tricky because uh, this means I will have to um, uh, I will have to handle that um, because the thing is currently Octoprint looks at this kill called stuff and also some other fatal uh, uh, things in order to handle fatal errors where it has to disconnect from the printer and notify the user about it because the whole printer is dead basically now. This is what this kill called thing means and here the thermal runaway system stop thing is still saying yeah the system is stopped but instead of telling me explicitly explicitly that the printer was halted and the kill called which all the other firmware out there does. Um, apparently, okay, this one not. See, another one. Um, it locks the temperatures, which I do not find very helpful here, but okay. So I'll have to modify the error detection here in order to yeah, trigger maybe actually on the word, words thermal runaway or system stopped or something like that. And this is information that I get out of that, which is helpful, yeah. There's also an, another variant here, down here, fix error and restart with M999, which is nice to know, but I mean, ah, that's a rep, that's repetitive apparently, yeah, because it, uh, this fatal pr uh, prefix is repetitive firmware. So at least repetitive firmware always prefixes completely fatal errors with a fatal uh, colon, which really helps in figuring it out. But still, you see the you see that we have just for thermal runaway situation, we have already four, uh, four versions of of message that can be generated for that. And this is why uh, writing a communication layer that works with all the firmware out there is such a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, this is a small example of that. Any case, anyhow, okay, so this was the quick look at the stats that I wanted to do. Um, which brings me already to the only single Q&A question that we have. So remember, there's a live chat. If you have questions, then ask them now. For those of you watching this live and not the recording that I'll push out later. Um, and the first question was from uh, Christian Häusler, who asks, uh, will there be a resume option soon? Resume a pause print after printer has been powered off. So I'm not going to talk about resume a post print without the power off because I mean that we already have. The problem really here is the has, the printer has been powered off situation. So why is this tricky? And first of all, um, yeah, um, or rather, this is a very challenging thing to do. Resuming a print after the printer has been powered off completely or, or lost power at least for the for the motors and the heaters. And, th and this being so tricky is also why I will probably not implement it in Core Octoprint, but let me explain. Um, so if a printer is powered off, then it has lost its position. So basically the, the firmware is off as well. So everything it had in the memory is now gone, which means position information, um, where the head was currently located in, in a 3D, three dimensional space plus the extruder and also if it has auto leveling, the bad leveling matrix is now also gone. gone. So um, additionally, if the printer is powered off completely, the steppers are no longer locked. So you can now freely move the axis around uh, and they will also maybe move a bit on their own. It depends a bit on, on which step the stepper was in when the lock vanished and it might do a little, little, little shift on its own, even if you don't touch it at all. So, what this means is that um, if you now power the printer back on and you want to resume stuff, you first have to give the printer a chance to know where the head even is. So you have to basically yeah, rehome it, uh, at least in X and Y, so that it knows again that its head is at zero at this point when you home it and then can travel to the coordinates that you tell it to because otherwise it doesn't know where it is. So it could be at zero, it could be at 10, 10, it could be uh, elsewhere. It won't know until you home it uh, or manually tell it where it is, which you would have to measure, which is not going to be a lot of fun. Because as I said, it could have shifted after you powered things down. So you cannot rely on it still being where it should be. So it's just persisting the coordinates in this case doesn't help you they might have changed. So 
Um, as I said, so X and Y, you can home. This usually will work, depends a bit on the reputability of your end stops, because if you have some end stop that can, I mean, you, you do not have, end stops usually do not have a reputability, reti re <laughs> end stops usually do not always trigger at the exact same point. So what I'm trying to say is if you home it once and then home it again, zero, 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 zero might not exactly be the same zero, zero, zero from before, which doesn't matter usually if you print because then you just home it once and then you print with this reference coordinate system. But if you now power everything off, position gets lost and all that, and then you home again, then you have a, might have a slight shift in the coordinate system. So this whether this is feasible or not really depends on the printer, really depends on the end stops um, and how reliable the position uh, positioning of, of stuff is. So mixed results, I would say. And even a slight shift will show. So uh, really not a good idea, maybe. Um, and then you have Z and Z is even more of a problem because you cannot home Z because your plate might be full and then your your nozzle will will ram into the the whole hot end will ram into your already printed uh, model and this is not going to work well at all so um additionally same problem really you also cannot relevel if you are still in the very first layers and it is not not really leveled out yet what you're printing there uh you will get leveling issues and you cannot re-level the print bed. And some printers might not even, might, might some firmwares might not even allow you to print unless you have leveled. Uh, I remember once running into some issue like that. I can't remember which printer it was though. So I might also be mistaken or maybe this is, was just a fluke. I don't know, but yeah. Um, so what this means is you will have to take an educated guess at the current Z position. Again, stepper, stepper drivers could have moved a bit, though in the Z axis it's a bit less likely, and usually when then it moves a bit down. Um, um, yeah, so um, the thing is that when Octoprint pauses a print, what it does, unless you uh, disable this checkbox in the serial settings, is that it... Um, before it pauses, it will wait for all the movements to stop. So it stops streaming G code to the printer. Then it tells the printer, uh, the firmware, um, to finish all the moves. And then it asks the firmware, so where is the head now? And it, then it it takes this information back from the printer, and it and it will um, yeah attach it to the to the pausing events and all that. So this information in, in principle is there. So we now know where our Z is and we also know where our E is. Um, they call the extruder coordinate, at least as long as the printer only has one, because if it has more than one, then it will only report one, uh, the current one. And so in multi-extruder uh, firmware setups, you already have an issue now. Um, yeah. But let's say we now have the, the coordinate where the printhead should be. Then we could now on power resume, first of all, home X and Y, and then tell the firmware, and by the way, your E is currently, at, sorry, your Z is currently at this and this height, and your E is, by the way, this number. But yeah, it, I mean, it could work, but it, as I said, it really depends on a lot of factors and a lot, it also depends on this information being accurate and not having any rounding errors, which it surely will have. And uh, yeah, so in a nutshell, the result will be that you will get a position reset, but it will not be exactly the same position that it should be because you will not be able in most cases, at least to fully repeat the, the, um, yeah, to, to get a full repeat position that you got when you started the print and then before the power went out. Yeah, so um, an additional problem that you get is um, the heaters were also shut off. If the printer does not have power, it cannot power any heaters. So you now have a printed model, a half printed model sitting on a, on a heat bed and the heat is off. And then it detaches. 
and now you have a problem because now you can completely forget about ever continuing the, this print job. So another thing that um, can cause problems, which all in all uh, being said is means that this really is a problem that at first look, it looks completely trivial because well, yeah, you can just persist where it is and then resume when you power on again. But yeah, it's not as easy when you take a look, a closer look at the details. And especially it is not really easy to solve it reliably so that it always works regardless of printer model and regardless of firmware version and regardless of whatever the user might have done in the meantime, like bumped the table with the model sitting on it or something like this, causing problems. So a um, couple of years ago, two or three years ago, I think I uh, actually did write um, a small proof of concept plugin thingy, which uh, uses some information uh, provided by Octoprint in order to allow something like print recovery. Um, uh, in a very stupid way and not really uh, not not really reliable because it didn't really solve all these issues at all. But uh, um, I also used that in order to write something more sophisticated f uh, in a very 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 controlled environment for a customer. And what I learned there is that in principle it's possible, but it heavily relies, as I said, on the machine in question. So. Um, if someone wants to give this a try in form of a plugin, I would certainly not be opposed to that, and I would be happy to see something like this on the on the plugin repository. But the problem is, considering the challenges in getting something like this to reliably work with anything out there under the sun that Octoprint has to interface with, some uh, firmwares out there do not even report positioning information back. So you would you would be completely on your own in that regard. You would not even be able to query the, the printhead position on, on power loss or, or on uh, on pause. So given this, I will really not, I would really not like to build something like this into core Octoprint because it would just lead to me drowning in tickets about a piece of functionality where I know that it isn't perfect and it, I know it will only cause issues. Um, and I know that I also cannot really fix it because uh, given the, the circumstances that I find myself in, that, that the whole um, the whole infrastructure situation and the whole um, fragmented landscape when it comes to firmware uh, compatibility and all that, with, given that, yeah, it, it would just be asking for trouble to implement something like this in Octoprint when I already know that, know that it will cause issues. And it would also probably frustrate a lot of people who would see, oh, cool, it can uh, recover prints from powered off printers. And then the first time that they try it, it fails spectacularly and they are really, really pissed now at me. And I really don't want that either. So, yeah, I'm not going to put this into Octoprint at all um, unless something changes and removes all these issues in some cool new firmware that is hopefully also very widespread because otherwise it doesn't make much of sense to implement it. Um, and, uh, yeah, as I said, if someone wants to give this a shot and, uh, with, with a big disclaimer in the plugin, basically saying, beware, can, can work or cannot work and do not take any responsibility and all for, for that and all that, be my guest. I will not hinder anyone, but I think there are a, a ton of other hard problems that I, that need to be tackled in, in core Octoprint without adding this additional one on top of it. So. Yeah, uh, not not going to happen. Sorry. Yeah. And now I'm going to climb down from that soapbox again and taking a look at the live chat. But there doesn't seem to be any question in there. So yeah, in that case, I'll just give it a bit more until I've done my wrap up. Nope. Um, yeah, so um, the next Octoprint on Air will take place in hopefully roughly a month, unless I suddenly notice, oops, it's June. Um, so wish me luck, this doesn't happen, please. And uh, as usual, I will also po post the appointment on Patreon and uh, I'll also 
switch back to myself. So um, I will also post the appointment on Patreon and uh, let you know in advance so that you can all uh, jot it down in your calendar and hopefully attend live. Um, and uh, since there still is no question in the live chat, I guess we'll just call it a day now, which, well, I warned you, it might be a bit on the short end today due to lack of questions. <laughs> Yeah, um, I hope it was interesting. Um, and uh, in any case, thanks for being here. And uh, I hope I see you the next time as well. And until then, I wish all of you happy printing. Bye.